Today, we're going to talk about one of the most important discussions that's currently going on in the cryptocurrency community, and that is the discussion over EIP-867 and EIP-999 for Ethereum. Now, if you don't know what an EIP is or what these two particular EIPs are, don't worry because we're going to get into the details of that. But for the most part, the coverage of this has been fairly thin with the exception of an article in Coindesk, which was fairly controversial. Uh, the reason this article was controversial is because it implied that there would be a contentious hard fork or that there could be a contentious hard fork, which would result in two different crypto assets, kind of like Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And as a result of that, there was this mini fight on Twitter where one of the developers for Ethereum said that the author of this article uh, really didn't use any of the information that he provided her in a private email exchange. And then furthermore, Vitalik also started to boycott Coindesk Consensus 2018 conference because of the fact, there's a couple of different reasons, but one of the reasons that he mentioned was that their coverage of EIP-999 was terrible as they published a highly sensationalist article claiming that the chain would split. So there has been just a little bit of coverage, but for the most part, it's been limited to the Ethereum community. And I don't think that should be the case because I think this has implications that go far beyond Ethereum. I think this has implications for public permissionless blockchains as a whole because it goes into the topics of decentralization, the degree of immutability that cryptocurrencies should desire, uh, cryptocurrency governance or crypto asset governance, and whether or not changes should be made at the protocol layer or the application layer. So there are some very important discussions that are going on surrounding these two particular EIPs that, again, I think affect almost all cryptocurrencies. So what is an EIP? Well, an EIP is nothing more than an Ethereum improvement proposal. Uh, it is a design document that provides information to the Ethereum community describing some sort of new feature or improvement to Ethereum. Now, one of the things I want to mention about EIPs is that it is a very technical process to write one. In fact, I'm almost 100% certain that I would not be able to write one without putting in an absurd level of time to make sure that the syntax is correct, to make sure that the technical details are correct, so on and so forth. This is not something that average Joe can write. And this is going to be an important detail when we discuss EIP-867. So I want you to remember that. The second thing I want you to remember is just because an EIP gets merged, that doesn't mean that it's going to be adopted by the Ethereum community. Okay, that's a very important distinction to make as well. So these two particular EIPs are very important. We're going to go ahead and start off with the first one here, which is EIP-999. So EIP-999, all it wants to do is restore the contract code of the wallet library contract at this particular address. And this wallet library is referred to by a lot of different multi-sig wallets that currently have 500,000 Ether locked into the Ether. Nobody can access those funds because this particular smart contract was killed by some random guy. In fact, it is legendary, this particular quote here. I accidentally killed it by a guy named DevOps199. Uh, he deleted his account since then, but he accidentally killed it. He was able to make himself the owner of the smart contract, and he was just messing around. He wasn't really trying to do anything nefarious of any sort. He wasn't trying to delete the funds. He just wanted to mess around with the Ethereum code. He was new to Ethereum, and he ended up killing one of the most important smart contracts on the entire Ethereum network. In fact, you can see what he did here. You can see him execute that kill function. So... If you want to understand what happened, I think one of the easiest ways to understand it is actually through Excel, because everybody's used Excel before. Uh, you may not fully understand what that what the equivalent is of what that person did. Well, I think this is going to make things very simple. So we're going to open up a new workbook. We're going to type one in cell A1, and then we're going to refer to cell A1, and uh, we're going to add anything we want. I'm just going to add one, okay? So I want you to imagine that cell A1 here, or, or this number one, 
is the Parity smart contract. Parity are the people who wrote that particular smart contract. And then I want you to imagine that this two here is all of the different multi-sig wallets that refer to this wallet library, this smart contract. What this guy did was the equivalent of right-clicking this, hitting delete, and deleting the entire row. And now all of a sudden, every single multi-sig wallet that referred to that smart contract returns this invalid reference error. That is the equivalent of what happened, right? These multi-sig wallets are using that smart contract for a lot of their logic. And as a result of that, when that smart contract got killed, all of a sudden a number of different functions within those multi-sig wallets, uh, they couldn't be executed anymore. So what this EIP-999 wants to do, okay, is it wants to restore that contract code. That is the equivalent in Excel as just simply hitting the undo keys, right? And all of a sudden, all the multi-sig wallets start to work again, and that 500,000 Ether that's currently locked up and frozen becomes unlocked, and the original owners will be able to access again. Uh, one of the things that's important to note about this, too, is that the owners of this ether, they're not just random rich people. It is businesses that want to develop for Ethereum. And Parity in particular, who is one of the major losses or one of the major losers in this particular event, is one of the mainstay developers for Ethereum for ever now, right? So this is something that's important to understand is that this has very good intentions. However, it is very controversial. In fact, if you've read anything about it on Reddit, you probably think it's the most evil EIP to ever be developed in the history of time. Uh, I don't think it's quite that bad. In fact, I don't even think it's bad at all. But it is controversial. And the reason why it's controversial is because it introduces what a lot of people view as a slippery slope. So the discussion here turns over to the idea of what types of recoveries should we be making, right? Because I want you to think about this for a second. I think the best argument that was made for this, uh, or one of the better arguments that was made for this, is does this introduce a concept of too big to fail, right? Uh, and what I mean by this is, let's say that there is some other developer of a wallet library that wants to attract a bunch of different multi-sig wallets to use their smart contract, right? Very similar to what Parity has done here. But they have way fewer multi-sig wallets. If we have these two wallet libraries on the Ethereum blockchain, people are going to want to congregate at the one that has more ether being influenced. And the reason why is because all of a sudden it becomes more likely if this particular EIP becomes adopted, it becomes a lot more likely that you're going to be safer putting your money in the wallet library that has more funds because it's more likely that's going to be recovered in the event of some sort of bug being found, right? So all of a sudden it introduces this monopoly type behavior on Ethereum development. Uh, furthermore, there is a slippery slope in terms of, you know, what particular recoveries do we want to accept versus which recoveries do we not want to accept? At what point do we say that immutability is not something that we should be sacrificing, right? If we're able to reverse transactions, which is what this is the equivalent of, right? We're reversing that self-destruct of this particular wallet library contract, if we're able to reverse those types of transactions, is that the equivalent of just completely removing immutability from Ethereum as a whole and going to the banking system? Now, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that's a very extreme argument, but that is one of the arguments that's being made by people who are against EIP-999. Now, the obvious argument for EIP-999 is that it would be restoring funds that obviously should never have been lost in the first place. And those funds are going to be used to improve Ethereum anyway. I don't think there's any nefarious actors in this particular situation. So a lot of the rejection of this EIP is on the basis of principle as opposed to, at least in my opinion, what would actually happen? What would the actual consequence of adopting this EIP be? Now, the other EIP because there is another argument against this EIP, which is that some people support the other 
EIP, which is 867. And this particular EIP, I've said that so many times now, uh, is to introduce a standardized format for Ethereum recovery proposals. So what this would do is it would enable anybody to write a recovery proposal, which is what this effectively is. It's not formatted the way that this particular EIP is asking for, although it could easily be changed into such. All this is supposed to do is make it so that anybody can write an EIP for the EIP editors to review. And if you want to see who those EIP editors are, you can actually see this in this particular document, right? These are the current EIP editors. All this would do is create a standardized format for which anybody could write one so that they could get their Ethereum back if, for example, they sent it to the wrong address. Maybe they did a typo or maybe they copied the wrong address or something along those lines. It has to be something where there is no, and this is an important element to understand here, there has to be no conflict of interest in terms of who owns those funds. Right, so if you typoed an address and sent it to an address that provably is nobody's, or at least the probability is that it is nobody's, and when I say probability, I don't mean like you know 90% chance. I'm talking 99.99999% chance that it's nobody else's. Uh, then yeah, you can get your your funds recovered. But if you, for example, were to send it to some address that is owned by somebody, even though you didn't intend for that person to receive it, you're not going to be able to get your funds recovered. At least that's my understanding of this particular EIP. The main arguments against this is that all of a sudden, this is going to introduce a number of questions when it comes to cryptocurrency governance, or in particular, Ethereum's governance. Because now all of a sudden these EIP editors have to look at all of these different recovery proposals and say which ones are done correctly, which ones are valid versus which ones aren't valid. Now there's going to be cases where it's cut and dry. The problem is not those cases. The problem is going to be the cases where it's not cut and dry in terms of what you should be doing with those particular recovery proposals. And it's also going to increase the workload on these EIP editors because as you can imagine, if this were to pass, we are all of a sudden going to see probably a huge increase in the number of EIPs that are written, which are really just ERPs, right? So it's going to increase the workload for these EIP editors and there's just uh, the question mark of, you know, can they be bribed? Are there going to be, you know, situations where they approve something that, uh, maybe the community doesn't like as a whole, but they feel forced to adopt because if the developers are adopting it, then everybody else is encouraged to as well, so on and so forth, right? So there are a number of question marks here when it comes to EIP 867, and there are people who are saying that, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be passing this type of EIP because it sacrifices the immutability associated with the Ethereum network and cryptocurrencies as a whole. So the discussions here are exceptionally interesting in my opinion. And if you want to learn more about this, I would really encourage you to look through these two threads on the Ethereum Magicians website for EIP 867 and EIP 999. I will include a link in the description, but there is practically every argument that you can possibly make on both of these EIPs in these forums and I they're really good reads for the most part so I would really encourage you to look through them there's also the argument that I forgot to mention that if you write bad code you deserve the penalty that's associated with it uh, that's the argument against the IP 999 for example it encourages people to be a little bit more sloppy with their code if they know that they can get their funds recovered if they make a mistake I disagree with that argument altogether I think that's a very poor argument because there's no situation Situation in which people are going to write sloppy code just because of the fact that they can get their funds possibly recovered, right? I mean, look at all the controversy that's going on over this. It's not guaranteed you're going to get your funds recovered. And then secondly, even if you do write a faulty, uh, you know, even if you have that situation where there is a compromise in your code and funds are taken away, if those funds are stolen, which means they're owned by somebody else, right? EIP 867 
is not going to save your ass in that particular situation. And EIP-999 almost certainly would never pass if the funds were stolen. I mean, think about how controversial the Dow situation was. You know, it, the likelihood that that occurs is almost zero. So you're still going to want to write code that is perfectly secure. I, I think that argument is awful. And I think all the people who are making that argument are just really, I think they have other arguments, but that are, I, I don't, I just don't understand that argument. It makes no sense to me. People aren't going to be sloppy just because they have the chance of recovering lost funds in the event that they write sloppy code. So that's my opinion on that. What is my overall opinion on these two EIPs? Well, personally, I, you know what? I haven't fully decided where I stand on this. I am definitely a lot less against it than most people. I think EIP 999 should be passed for certain. Uh, I think that one is fairly straightforward for me. It's EIP 867 that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, the reason why I think EIP 999 should be passed is just because of the fact that, you know, in this particular situation, the number or the amount of funds that have been lost is absolutely mind baffling, right? I mean, 500,000 ether. It's not like this is a small situation. And yes, it's hard to determine subjectively where that cutoff point should be. You know, is $50 million enough? Is $100 million enough? Where is the cutoff point at which it is enough to want to recover those funds. But, you know, we're talking over $300 million. I think it's worth recovering them. But more importantly, in addition to that, there's this bonus here where those funds were going to be used to improve the Ethereum network anyway. So honestly, I think this is perfectly fine. You know, it's with people or participants that have been involved with the Ethereum community since the beginning. It's not like it's just random, you know, participants that are involved here. I mean, we're talking about parity, right? And then furthermore, you know, with EIP 867, I'm not entirely sure where I stand on this particular one because, you know, my major concern is with the off-chain decisions that have to be made with this E or with these EIP editors. Uh, it's a lot of power to pass over to them. It's also a lot of responsibility to pass over them in terms of, you know, when should we be rewriting history in blockchains, which we often associate with immutability. I don't know where I stand on EIP-867. I am somebody that is more inclined to be in favor of EIP-867. I think that more centralization uh, in blockchains is not necessarily such a bad thing. If the goal is for mass adoption, it does have to be uh, a little bit more accessible to people that want to use this. EIP-867 is not going to benefit average Joe, though. EIP-867 is going to benefit businesses that want to use Ethereum. And I think that that is one argument in its favor, right? It's not going to make it so that everybody can rewrite the history of the Ethereum blockchain because not anybody is going to be able to write these ERPs. Most of the time, I think the people that are going to be writing these ERPs are going to be businesses that lose a substantial amount of Ether that would want to be using that anyway for improving the Ethereum network, sort of like this situation here with EIP-999. So it's a tough decision in terms of what to do with these. I would really encourage that you look into them because, again, I think there are ramifications or implications for this that go far beyond Ethereum. Uh, so make sure you learn about this, read up about it, get educated on these two particular EIPs because I think they're exceptionally important. I'm sorry that I rambled so long about this. I didn't expect the video to go so long, but it's an interesting topic in my opinion, and I really wanted to share it with all of you. Uh, as usual, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure you check out my Steemit if you would like to support me. It's a real easy way to do so, and the quality of the comments on there tend to be a lot higher. So make sure you check that out if you're interested. Otherwise, as usual, leave a like, comment, and subscription, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.